right, welcome back. I want to talk about now Newton's second law. So the first law, like a story, first law says if the net force is zero, then the velocity would be constant. Now you might ask, if the net force is not zero, what happens? Newton's second law answers that question. So you have the absence of forces, the velocity would be constant. How about if the forces are present, what happens? Well, it says, in the if, the, if, if there is a net force on an object, then, so the second law, I will write it just in the math form, then it says, the net force on an object, the net force on an object is equal to, I will write it in the general form that we will encounter later, and then uh, I will reduce it to the, to the more familiar form. It says that the, the net force on an object, meaning take all the forces on an object, maybe you have 15 forces on it, take them, add them as a vector, and you will just come up with a net vector in a certain direction. That net force is equal to the rate of change of the momentum of the object, dt. And this p here is called momentum, and it is equal to mass times velocity, so dm v dt. If the mass is constant, when you take a derivative, it comes out. If the mass is constant, if the mass is constant, mass is constant, okay, if the mass is constant, then you have the following. The m comes out, and you have dv dt. And dv dt is the acceleration, so you have ma. So this is the more familiar form where you get f equals to ma. Usually people will just give you this form, and then when we talk about momentum, they say, oh, by the way, we didn't really tell you the whole truth. It's actually dp dt, the rate of change of momentum. So I'm telling you that ahead of time right now. So it says that the net force here, if the mass is constant, and the mass is usually constant, it would be constant, and we would just leave, uh, we have this. So here's what it says, that the net force on an object is equal to the mass times acceleration of the object. So Newton doesn't tell you how to get those net forces. You have to find the net forces and then use the net forces and the mass of the object to calculate the acceleration of the object. And if you know the initial position of the object, you know the initial position, uh, the initial velocity of the object, and you have just calculated the acceleration of the object, then you know the position of the object at all future times, and you know the velocity of the object at all future times. So it's your job. Newton doesn't tell you how to calculate the net force. You have to do it. And a big part of what we're going to do um, is to uh, calculate that net force and use it to calculate the acceleration. And so this is not just equality here uh, in the math sense. It's actually, this is called the cause. This is the effect. So a force causes an acceleration. The force is the cause. The acceleration is the effect. Um, or the acceleration is just a symptom, is the symptom. If you have an acceleration, then you know there has to be an underlying force, okay? There has to be an underlying, uh, there has to be a force there that, that has caused uh, that acceleration. So now, um, first of all, let me just discuss units. We know that the mass is in kilograms, the acceleration is in meters per second, so the units of force uh, usually people write it this way, like this, meaning units, units of force would be kilograms times meters per second, kilograms, uh, meters, I'm sorry, kilograms, meters per second squared, because acceleration is meters per second squared, and that is called a Newton, one Newton, one N, capital N, one Newton, okay? Now, physics is an experimental science. You write an equation, you better be able to design an experiment where you can measure the acceleration, where you can measure the mass, where you can measure the force. So I ask you, you can pause this and uh, think about it. How would you measure the acceleration of an object? What equipment do you need to measure the acceleration of an object? Well, the acceleration, so the answer, it's in meters per second squared. So what you need is meter sticks. You need a way to measure position. Okay? You need a way to measure position. And you need a way to measure time. If you know the position of the object at all times, so let's say the object is here, 
I measure the position here. A little bit later, I measure the velocity. I'm sorry, I measure the position, and it's here. Right? I measure the position, and it's here. And then a little bit later, I measure the position, and it's maybe it's a little here. It's accelerating for each amount is delta t. Let's say after one second, the object is here. After another one second, it's the object is here. So what I can do is I can use these two positions to find the average velocity between here and here, and then use these two positions to find the average velocity between here and here. So I have, let me call this one here uh, x position 1, this is position 2, this is position 3, and I would call here the, this is the velocity between here and here, it's the average velocity, I would just call it v1, and then uh, the velocity here is v2, and then so the velocity changed from here to here over an amount delta t from here to here. So this one, an amount, let's say if this is one se uh, zero seconds after one second, two seconds, so this would be halfway through, would be half a second, this is one and a half seconds. So the time difference is still one second. So I can use the difference in velocity to find the acceleration. So I need three position readings, a minimum of three position readings to calculate an acceleration. But it can be done. Because all you need is a way to measure position, and, the, and we defined what a meter was. It can be as simple as this, or in terms of the speed of light. We know how to measure time using clocks, right? Uh, like cesium clock, remember? Uh, you can refer to it. So we're confident uh, how, in how to measure the acceleration. We can do that. Great. Fine. So that's done. That's one thing that you can do. The force, we have no way to measure force yet. Okay, we don't know yet. We will have a way in a moment. But, uh, so now, how about the mass? How do we measure it? If you remember, we said we can define this to be the kilogram. Right? Somebody in France, there is some platinum uh, iridium, I think, cylinder that has, uh, that has been defined as the kilogram. If you're on Earth, no problem. You can put a balance, you can put a balance, uh, the way how you find the mass is you, you have a balance here. You place one mass here, one mass here, and then they balance. All right, so I mean, you can get away with that if you're on Earth. Uh, however, how about if you're in outer space and you want to tell somebody who doesn't live on Earth and you want to tell them about the kilogram, so they live in outer space, you can put a kilogram here and 10,000 kilograms here, and they would still balance because there is no gravity. Everything just stands there like this. It's in constantly falling. But the, this thing will not tilt one way or another. So how do we do it? Um, so yeah, so how, how do we do that? So think about it. Uh, one way we will learn about springs and that if you attach a mass to the spring, even in outer space, when you stretch the spring, there is a spring force. Stretch it, let it oscillate based on the time for the oscillations and the force constant of that spring uh, will give us, we will figure out what the mass is. Another way is to, if you're in outer space, so tie those two, two masses by a rod, so connect them by a rod. So here is M1 and here is M2. Attach the rod in the middle here, attach it by a, a rope and pull on the rope, pull on the rope. Put on the rope halfway. If the two masses they move this way, then they are they have equal mass. If the two masses, if this one lags behind this one, it means this one is heavier. So you need to to reduce that chip from it a little bit to uh, make it into exactly one kilogram. So why am I mentioning this? Because I just want to remind you that physics it, so a lot of times it looks very mathematical and theoretical, and it is. Uh, but at the end, it is a, it is a, uh, it's a science, and it's experimental-based science. You have to be able to measure things. So now, um, if you have a way to measure mass and acceleration, then you have a way to measure force. You apply a force to a noun mass, so you know the mass, let's say, and, uh, and you see how much acceleration that force causes. Once you know that, once you know how much acceleration it has caused, because you know how to measure acceleration, you already know what the mass is, then you know the force, the product. You say, all right, I applied a certain force to my mass 
I apply the certain force to my mass, and let's say my mass is one kilogram, and it caused an acceleration of two meters per second squared, and so I say my force has to be uh, equal to two newtons. That's the, the force. It has to be two newtons. One times two is two newtons. And so you say, all right, now uh, this acceleration is, is, is actually is, is two newtons. I'm sorry, this force is two newtons. And you calibrate that. Um, and then so you would have a way to, to measure forces. For example, if you take a mass, you, uh, if you take a mass, you attach it on a spring, you stretch the spring a little bit and you let it go. It will accelerate. And when it accelerates, you measure the acceleration, you know the mass, and you say, oh, when I stretch the spring to this far, it was able, based on the acceleration and the mass, it was able to apply one newton. So you say, when my spring is stretched by, let's say, one centimeter, it will give me a force of, let's say, two newtons. You go ahead and stretch the spring now to two centimeters, and you say, oh, when my spring is stretched to two centimeters, it caused this much acceleration, you multiply it by the mass and you say, oh, it causes four newtons of, of force, and so on and so forth, so you can calibrate your spring. Long story short, we know how to calculate the force and we know how to calculate the mass. Uh, I'm sorry, we know how to, not calculate, we know how to measure the mass, we know how to measure the acceleration, and we know how to measure the force experimentally in the lab. Okay, So that is now Newton's second law. Now, how about Newton's third law? The third law says, um, uh, is concerned about the entity basically that applies the force, or maybe the two entities. So the first law, let's remind ourselves. The first law says, in the absence of forces, if the net force or the net force on an object is equal to zero, then the object will continue moving in a straight line at constant velocity, including zero. Maybe the object is at rest. It will not move at all if the net force is zero. The second law says, all right, well, I mean, the first law sounds too boring. If the net force is zero, nothing really ha nothing interesting happens. The second law answers the question, what if there is a force? What happens? It answers it. It says, calculate that net force, and it will cause an acceleration. It will equal to ma. Assuming the mass is constant. Otherwise, you have to use the more general form. We come back to this in chapter 8, I think, or 9. Um, anyways. Uh, or maybe like, I think chapter 10, <laughs> all the way to chapter 10. Um, all right, sounds good. So that's Newton's second law. So first law, in the absence of forces, uh, or if the net force is zero, the velocity is constant. Second law, if there is a force on an object, um, then the net force on that object will equal to the mass of that object times acceleration. Now, we always talked about this object that's experiencing a force or maybe not experiencing a force. How about the thing that applies the force? So let's say it's me. Uh, I push this eraser this way. How about me? What happens to me? Newton's third law says, if I apply a force, I will feel a force. And that force is equal to the force I have applied in magnitude and opposite to it in direction. So it says, for every action, there is a reaction. So the third law. Uh, the, for every action, there is a reaction equal to it in magnitude, opposite to it in direction. So let's say you have objects one and two. The force on object one due to object two in magnitude will equal to the force on object two due to object one in magnitude. How about in direction? Well, you can write the vector form, and they have a minus sign between each other. They're equal in magnitude, they're opposite in direction. So that's the third law. Action, reaction. Another way to say it is, uh, if you apply a force, you experience a force, just as big. Uh, if you push, you get pushed. Uh, that's another way to say it. Um, another way to say it, uh, or you will see it, is forces come in pairs. Forces come in pairs. If you apply a force, there is a force opposite to it, uh, equal to it in magnitude and opposite to it in direction. You cannot just have a force on an object without an entity that feels that force back. Okay? So if an entity applies a force, well, it will feel a force back. And so it, it says basically forces come in pairs. They come in pairs. They have to come in pairs because you apply a force, you will feel a force. So they, they always come in pairs. You can't apply a force and then feel nothing. Newton's third law says that can't happen. And it turns out that 
This is very important for the law of conservation of momentum. The law of conservation of momentum. Because to change the momentum here, you need a net external force. But the force that's external to this object will cause this object to change its momentum. But then the object that the entity that has applied the force will feel a force back that's opposite to it uh, in direction and equal in magnitude. So there is a an equal and negative change in momentum for that other object. And uh, so then the total momentum change in the world will just be zero, meaning momentum will be uh, will be conserved. OK, so that is the third law. Now, we have uh, what's called free body diagrams. So now. The most mileage uh, we will get is from the second law. That's the law that we will use the most. So uh, here is an object. And let's say it's resting on a table. Our object, let's say, is resting on a table. And um, you look at it. I tell you that the object is resting on the table. So you ask, what are the forces on the object? So let me draw the, my object. So we ask, notice the question, the forces on the object. Here is our object. I don't care about the table. So we're concerned about the object. If I ask what are the forces on the table, that's a different story. There will be forces on the table. I said, what are the forces on the object here? Well, uh, our object is on Earth, as usual, or usually that's the case, uh, unless you're told otherwise. If you're told it's outer space, then gravity would be zero. Um, then if it's on Earth, then there is the force of gravity. And the question is, in what direction is the force of gravity? We said force of gravity always pulls you down, straight down, toward the Earth. And uh, by the way, here is the Earth. If you're here, the force of gravity is this way. If you're here, the force of gravity is this way. If you're here, the force of gravity. It always pulls you toward the center. But if you zoom into the Earth, it looks flat. It looks like this, right? Locally, it looks very flat. You have to go very far away to see the, the curvature. Uh, so locally, it looks horizontal. And so the force of gravity will just be straight down. Okay? It'll be straight down. And we just, just give it the force of gravity symbol. Sometimes I write the vector sign. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes, because I know the direction. So if I know the magnitude and I know the direction, I know the complete story. Now, this can't be the only thing. So it's in contact. It's in contact with the table. And if it's in contact with the table, then there has to be a normal force between the table and the object. Or there possibly is a normal force. So I will just draw the normal force. And usually I just draw the normal force here. But it's an interaction force. It's a contact force. It, it really happens here. It doesn't matter because it's, it's a vector. And it just happens to be that way. That's the normal force. So the net force on this object, so uh, you to apply Newton's laws, or yeah, Newton's second law, it's very simple. Uh, it's actually, you have to just include all the forces that are present, but do not make up any new forces that don't exist. Don't make up any forces that do not exist. So for example, here you say, the object is in contact with the table, there has to be a normal force. And we know the property of normal forces, they always push you away from the surface in a perpendicular direction. So here is the surface, and they push you away from the surface in a perpendicular direction. We're on Earth. In what direction is, uh, does the Earth pull you? It pulls you straight down, and it's always perpendicular to in the downward direction, just the downward direction. So Newton's second law says the mass is not changing. So we're, we're just, from now on, I'm not going to use this. We'll just go here. The net force on an object will equal to the mass times the acceleration of the object. I will choose my coordinate system. You say, all right, here's the x, here is the y direction. In the x direction, I will put the net force, uh, the net force in the x direction. There is none. There is no forces. There are no forces in the x direction, so that's zero. And by Newton's second law, the net force in the x direction will equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. But that's zero. We said it's zero. So the acceleration in the x direction is zero, meaning the object is not going to move this way. It will not move in the x direction, left or right. How about up and down? Well, we'll write the net force on the object in the y direction. What are they? Um, 
Well, in the positive y direction, there is a normal force upward. Normal force. Notice I'm not going to write the vector sign because the normal force is in the y direction and it's in the positive y direction, so I just write little n. The force of gravity is in the downward direction, so I'll put it as minus the force of gravity. And we know that the net force in the y direction will equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. And we're told that the object is resting on the table and it has no acceleration, so the acceleration in the y direction is zero. So I have a zero here. So the conclusion is that little n, the normal force minus the force of gravity will equal to zero. So the normal force minus the force of gravity will equal to zero, and therefore the normal force will equal to the force of gravity. Now, how much is the force of gravity on an object? What is the pull of gravity on an object? It turns out, since if I let this object fall, it will fall down at a constant rate, and that rate is, uh, is, the, is the acceleration, uh, mg, uh, uh, I'm sorry, g is the, is the acceleration due to gravity. So if you only had gravity present, it would cause an acceleration of g, and so the force of gravity is just a mass, the mass of the object times gravity. So in this case, if the object is resting, then the normal force will equal to mg, the mass of the object times gravity. Okay, so that's that. So let's do a couple more uh, examples. And by the way, this is called a three-body diagram, where you draw just the object and the forces on that, on that object. So let me go to... Uh, uh, an, another example, example here, uh, here is my, let me put the example, so I have my object, uh, so let's say here is the table now, here is my object, and we will make the, the examples a little more uh, complicated as we go, here is my object, and uh, the object has mass m. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pull my object in this direction with a force f, with a, with a pulling force to the right. I'm just pulling it this way. Either there is a handle on the object, or maybe I'm tying it with a rope and pulling it to the right, whatever. So I'm pulling it to the right. And let's say that force is 10 uh, newtons. And let's say this object is five kilograms. Right. So what are the forces on the object? Well, we drew one already. That's the force to the right. And uh, earlier we mentioned that there is the force of gravity, the force of gravity. And remember, force of gravity is the mass of the object times gravity. In our case, the object is five kilograms and gravity is 9.8. So five times 9.8 is 49, 49 newtons. And then there is the normal force uh, normal force upward. And as usual, here's my x direction, and here's my y direction. The object is going to accelerate in the x direction. So the acceleration is this way, is in the x direction. What does that mean? This means that the x component of acceleration is just a, and the y component of acceleration is zero. It's accelerating horizontally, so it doesn't have a y component. And the x component of acceleration is just a, whatever it is. So let's find it. So we know that in the y direction, in the y direction, in the y direction, I know that there is the net force, the net force, I will write this a few times, the net force in the y direction will be the normal force because it's upward, it's positive n, minus the force of gravity because it's downward will equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction, but the acceleration in the y direction is zero, so we get zero. That means that the normal force will equal to the force of gravity, and it is equal to 49, 49 newtons. Okay, sounds good. Um, but I would like to find the acceleration. So in the x direction, in the x direction, I have the net force, in the x direction will equal to what? What is the net force in the x direction? What are the forces involved? 
uh, they told me that there is only one force, it's 10 newtons. Apparently there is no friction on this earth. We will consider friction soon. So there is only 10 newtons. That's the net force, it's just the 10 newtons. And that has to equal to the mass times acceleration by Newton's second law. The, ma the mass times acceleration in what direction? Since I'm considering the net force in the x direction, the acceleration in the x direction. Which is, we agreed to call it just ma. The acceleration in the x direction is just a. And so I have uh, 10 on the left side. The mass is, how much was it? Uh, 5 kilograms. And the acceleration is a. And so the acceleration would be 2 meters per second squared, which is 10 over 5. That's 2 meters per second squared. And so now, if you, if you know the acceleration and you know the initial position of the object, you can get asked a question like, after 3 seconds, where would the object be? Then you, if you know the acceleration, you can use kinematics and figure out what the velocity is a little bit later, knowing that the initial velocity is, let's say, 0. And you will know the position afterwards, and so on. Uh, let us do uh, another example, and then I will consider. Uh, uh, yeah, let us do uh, an example for the incline, and then we will consider friction later. So here is an inclined plane. The plane. Uh, by the way, this problem here always, uh, for some reason it's the least liked problem, but we have, everybody wants to do physics to learn the new theories, the, fa the fancier stuff, but you have to start here, or here, actually even before, or actually over there. <laughs> so, um, so we have to start here. So let's say theta is uh, whatever, maybe it's 30 degrees or so. And let's say I have a perfectly smooth surface. And I have my object, my object, it has a mass m, my object has mass m, and uh, the very first question will be, uh, this is the ground, and the question is, what are the forces involved in this case? What are the forces involved here? Well, it's in Earth, so there is gravity, and gravity always pulls you down straight, straight downward. So here's Earth, so gravity always pulls you down. And we're concerned about the motion of this object. So our object gets pulled down straight. Right? This is meaning this is like a 90 degree angle, just straight down. This is the force of gravity. And the force of gravity is mg. Is mg. Okay? My question is, are there any other forces on the object? The answer is yes. And they have to be contact forces. It has to be a contact force because the object is touching the ramp. The object is resting on the ramp, so there could be a normal force. And normal forces always act perpendicular to the, the ramp. So the ramp is here, so the ramp will push you away. Because you want to fall straight down, but the ramp is preventing you. So please notice that the normal force of the ramp is not straight up. It has to be perpendicular. It has to be in this direction. Let me draw it like the base also here. This will be the normal force from the ramp, that way, in that direction, meaning this is a 90 degree angle. That's a 90 degree angle, all right? So that is that. All right, sounds good. Are there any other forces? The answer is no. And if you say yes, I ask you, what are they? Um, I mean, it, the, our object is only touching the ramp so that's the only contact force. It's on Earth, there has to be the gravitational force, and that's it. There is no friction or anything. You're told that this is a perfectly smooth surface. So the question is, uh, how will the object move? The object is not going to sink into the ramp because we're assuming the ramp is rigid and the normal force will be as much as it needs to be to prevent motion into the ramp. All the motion will be along the ramp. So by assumption, the motion would be along the ramp. That's the direction of acceleration, along the ramp. So in this case, you might be tempted to say, here is the x and here is the y, and the acceleration would be this way. That would be a terrible choice because 
If you have an acceleration this way, then the acceleration will have two components. One of them is this way, and one of them is this way. And that's not a good idea for that. Always choose, if you can, the direction where the acceleration only has one component. Choose your x direction in the direction of acceleration. So what we will do is we will choose our x-axis to be this way. This will be our x-axis along the ramp because that's the direction of motion. And our y-axis will be perpendicular to it, so it's along the normal force. So this is the x-direction, and this is the y-direction. the y direction. Okay, that's the y-direction. So now, uh, how are we going to uh, study the motion? Well, we know that the net force is equal to the mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law. Make sure I don't run out of... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm actually running out. Uh, I will go to the next video and talk about this one again.